Number three, Terry Bowers. In the spring of 1970, Terry Bowers was 11 years old. He was the second oldest of a family of six, and he and his family lived in Darby, which is a borough in Pennsylvania. He was in the sixth grade at the Blessed Virgin Mary School, which is part of the borough's Catholic parish. A year earlier, he joined Boy Scout Troop 275, which was based out of the parish. On Friday, April 24, 1970, Terry and 23 other scouts, along with six idle chaperones, set off on a camping trip. The campsite was on the property of another Catholic church called St. Basil the Great, which is about 30 miles away in East Pikeland Township. The scouts and their chaperones set up their tents about 200 yards from the church in an open field near a creek. The first night was uneventful. The boys spent the Saturday doing activities and no one noted anything unusual happening that day. Just before 7.30 on Sunday morning, the boys started to stir. A few of the boys went to Terry's tent and opened it up. Then they started screaming. 11-year-old Terry Bowers was lying in a pool of blood. An adult went to help him, but Terry was already dead. The police were called, and they arrived shortly afterward. Terry was in his pajamas, and he was still in his sleeping bag. The medical examiner determined that he had been stabbed four times in the back through the sleeping bag. The murder weapon was a small bladed knife with one edge. The police did three massive searches for the knife using metal detectors, but it was never found. The medical examiner determined that Terry was probably killed around 6.30 a.m., about an hour before his body was found. Amazingly, even though Terry's tent was just a few feet from the rest of the campers, no one heard or saw anything unusual. What the police could figure out was the motive. Why would someone do something as risky as sneak into a camp where 30 people were sleeping just to kill 11-year-old Terry Bowers? The police interviewed hundreds of people in the days after the murder. They even had some of Terry's fellow Boy Scouts take polygraph exams. But they never found a viable suspect, and today, the case is considered cold. The murder shocked the borough, and 1,500 people came to pay their respects at Terry's visitations and funeral. Decades later, people who knew Terry, especially those who were on the same camping trip, are still haunted by his murder. Terry's family is hoping, even after 48 years, that one day the case will be solved. Number 2. The Lake Bottom Murders On June 4, 1960, 18-year-old Seppo Antro Bozeman, who lived in Espo, Finland, borrowed a tent from his work. Then he and his friend, Niels Gustafsson, who was also 18, picked up 15-year-olds Mela Irlmela Borklin and Anya Tulikmaki on their motorcycles. They drove to the shore of Lake Bottom, which is a small lake outside of Espo. That afternoon, the group bought some sausages and lemonade from a kiosk near their campsite. That night, they couldn't get a fire going to cook the sausages, so they ate them cold. When they went to bed, it was dark. At about six o'clock the next morning, two boys who were out bird watching noticed a man with blonde hair walking away from the campsite. Five hours later, at around 11 a.m., a man brought his sons to the lake to swim. He happened upon the teen's campsite. The tent had collapsed and two bodies were laying outside of it. One of the bodies was Niels Gustafsson. He was bloody and writhing on the ground. The man found a phone and called the police. They arrived an hour later and Gustafsson was taken for medical attention. Unfortunately, it was too late for the other three teenagers. 
the killer, or killers, cut the guy ropes of their tent, which caused it to collapse. He then climbed onto the collapsed tent with the teen still inside, and using a knife and a blunt instrument, he stabbed and beat the teens through the tent's fabric. Neither murder weapon was found, but the blunt instrument is believed to have been a rock or a pipe. Gustafsson survived the attack. He suffered a concussion, a broken jaw, and his forehead had been cut. His head injury was so severe that he had to relearn how to walk. He said that he barely remembered anything from the attack. He remembered going to bed, and the next thing he knew, he was waking up in the hospital. The only thing he remembered was that the killer was possibly wearing black and red. Gustafsson underwent hypnosis, but the police never made it public what he said while he was hypnotized. Gustafsson doesn't even know what he said while he was hypnotized. It is thought that the attack happened sometime between 4 and 6 a.m. 6 a.m. is the time that the two boys saw the blonde man walking away from the crime scene. There were no signs of sexual assault, but items were stolen. This included a small amount of money, a jacket, two pairs of shoes, a bag, one of the girl's scarves, and a towel. The killer didn't touch either of the young men's motorcycles. Over the decades, there have been several suspects. In 2003, a book was published by a doctor named Jorma Paolo, who worked at a hospital in Espo, and in the book, he claims that a man named Hans Osman was the person who killed the teens. Paolo said that Osman, who immigrated to Finland from Germany, came into the hospital the day after the murders with some injuries. He was apparently acting erratically, and he couldn't explain how he sustained the injuries. Paulo then asserts that Osman was a Nazi, and during World War II, he was captured by the Soviets. Osman then became a spy for the KGB. The police investigated Osman, and they said he had an airtight alibi for the time of the murder, so they eliminated him as a suspect. Another suspect was a man named Carl Valdemir Gilstrom, who lived a little more than a mile away from the crime scene. The day before the murders, the teenagers bought food and drinks from a kiosk. Gilstrom owned and operated that kiosk. Gilstrom, who was 50 years old at the time of the murders, was considered a bully by people who lived near him. He supposedly terrorized many of his neighbors, and they were afraid of him. Gilstrom supposedly hated people sleeping on the beach. He was known to sabotage people's tents as they slept in them. Supposedly, Gilstrom told a few people that he was the one who killed the teens. On August 2nd, 1969, just over nine years after the massacre, Gilstrom went swimming in Lake Bottom. Even though he was a strong swimmer, he never made it back to shore. It is commonly believed that his drowning was a suicide. The police interview Gilstrom's wife, and she swears that he was at home in bed with her at the time of the murders. The police searched Gilstrom's home, and they found nothing that linked him to the triple homicide. Because of the lack of evidence in his wife's statement, Gilstrom was cleared as a suspect. Then in March 2004, 44 years after the massacre, there was a strange twist in the case. The police made an arrest. They arrested Niels Gustafsson, the lone survivor. The police had his shoes examined, and they found blood from a female on them. The police thought that Gustafsson wanted to have sex with one of the girls, but she said no. And Gustafsson got kicked out of the tent, and he got in a fight with Seppo Antro Bozeman. It was during this fight that Gustafsson had his jaw broken. The police said in retaliation for breaking his jaw, Gustafsson killed everyone, then possibly injured himself further, got rid of the weapons, and then laid on the ground until they were found. In the years since the murders, Gustafsson got married, had two kids, and he worked as a mechanic and a driver 
for a bus company. He swore he was innocent. He claimed he didn't remember anything from that night, except that the killer was possibly wearing black and red. In August 2005, Gustavuson, who was 63, went to trial. His lawyers argued the physical evidence showed that he was a victim and not the killer. The teens were attacked by someone outside of the tent, and Gustavuson's blood was found inside of the tent. Also, there was DNA found on the tent that didn't belong to any of the teens. The DNA from the fifth person has not been matched to anyone. Gustafsson was ultimately acquitted of the murders. After the trial, Gustafsson was awarded compensation for the emotional distress of being in prison in the lead up to his trial. The DNA from the fifth person has yet to be compared to either Carl Valdemar Gilstrom or Hans Osman. The families of the victims and many people in Finland want the DNA to be compared to both men's DNA so that maybe one of the most notorious unsolved mysteries in Finland's history can finally be solved. Number 1. Lisa Guerreri and Brandon Rumba 19-year-old Lisa Guerreri and 20-year-old Brandon Rumba of Scottsdale, Arizona started dating in October 2002. Guerreri worked for Salt River Project Power and Water and Rumba was a student at Arizona State University. He also worked as a part-time personal trainer and he wanted to open a gym after he finished school. Before their first anniversary, they were living together. To celebrate their first anniversary, the couple wanted to go to Disneyland, but they quickly realized that they couldn't afford it. Instead, on October 19th, 2003, they decided to go camping overnight. They asked Lisa's mother if they could borrow her Ford F-150. She didn't want them to take the truck because it needed an oil change. But she relented and let them take it. They drove to Bumblebee Road in Yavapai County, which is just north of Phoenix. They got into the bed of the truck presumably to do some stargazing, among other activities, and then they fell asleep. The next day, they didn't return home, and their parents reported them missing. Their parents got in contact with the couple's friends, and they started to search for them. That afternoon, some of their friends found the couple in the bed of the truck. They were still in their sleeping bags, they both have been shot multiple times in the head. The police were called and they were baffled by the crime scene. The killer, or killers, didn't leave any evidence behind besides the bullets in the couple's heads. No shell casings were found, nor were there any tire tracks found. They have no clue what the motive was. Nothing was stolen and there were no signs of sexual assault. Without any evidence to go on, the police can't say if the murders were random or the couple was targeted. Friends and family said that the couple didn't have any enemies. It was as if someone happened upon the couple while they were sleeping, shot them multiple times in the head for the sake of killing them, and then presumably driving off into the night. It wasn't long before the case went cold. One possible lead is that the murders are similar to other murders that happened on the west coast within three years of Guerreri and Rumba being killed. About 10 months after Guerreri and Rumba were killed, on August 16, 2004, Lindsay Cutshaw, 22, and Jason Allen, 26, were reported missing when they didn't show up for work at Christian Camp in El Dorado County, California. Cutshaw and Allen met at a Bible camp, and they were set to be married a few months later, on September 11, 2004. The last time anyone heard from the couple was two days earlier, when they left to go camping and whitewater rafting. Their bodies were found just outside of Jenner, California. Their bodies were in separate sleeping bags, 
They both had been shot once in the head with a rifle. Then 10 months later, on July 1st, 2005, the bodies of 54-year-old Stephen Hagen and 56-year-old Jeanette Bauman and their dog were found by campers outside of Oak Ridge, Oregon. The couple, who were teachers in Montana, were on a camping trip. They had been shot to death. Two different casings were found at the crime scene. One kind was for a high-powered gun, and the other was for a low-powered gun. The police think that the killer shot at them from afar at first, and then used the second gun to shoot at a closer range. This time, the killer took some items. This included a gun that the couple owned, and a license plate from their car. It's believed that these were stolen as souvenirs, and robbery was not the motive for the murders. Finally, just over a year later, on July 10, 2006, Mary Cooper, 56, and her daughter, Susanna Cooper Stodden, 27, were shot to death while they were on a hike near Granite Falls, Washington. Once again, the crime seemed motiveless. Mary was a librarian, and Susanna worked with a nonprofit group that taught children about nature, and she was starting an internship at a private school in the autumn. The mother and daughter didn't have any enemies, so it's unclear why they were targeted. One suspect in some of the cases is serial killer Israel Keyes. Keyes was born in January 1978 in Richmond, Utah. His neighbor and friend was a man named Chevy Kehoe. Kehoe was a white nationalist, and in 1995, he robbed a gun dealer and then killed a gun dealer and his family. Two years later, Kehoe hadn't been arrested for the triple homicide. The one day in 1997, Kehoe and his brother were pulled over by the police and they got into a gunfight with the police. The brothers were able to escape the gunfight unharmed. Luckily, no police officers were injured either. Keo's brother eventually turned himself in and he told the police where his brother was hiding. Keho was arrested a short time later and he was eventually sentenced to life without parole. When Keo was arrested, Keyes was 19 years old. By then, Keyes had supposedly committed his first sexual assault. In 2007, Keyes moved to Anchorage, Alaska, where he started his own construction company. He then started a strange serial murder spree. He would fly to different places in the United States and hide or bury murder kits. The murder kits included weapons and materials to kidnap and kill his victims along with some money. He got the money for the murder kids from robbing banks. On February 2nd, 2012, Keyes kidnapped 18-year-old Samantha Canning, who worked as a barista in Anchorage. Keyes picked Canning at random. She just happened to be working at a coffee stand that was open later than any other business around it. While wearing a ski mask, he kidnapped Canning at gunpoint. He took her to a shed that was on his property. He sexually assaulted her and then asphyxiated her. After killing her, Keyes went on a cruise for two weeks. When he returned home, he propped up Canning's body to make it look like she was alive. He then took a picture of her body along with that day's newspaper and then sent the picture to her parents as a ransom demand. And over the next several days, he dismembered her body and dumped the pieces in a lake. Nearly a month later, Keyes used Canning's debit card, and the camera on the ATM recorded his car, which gave the police the break in the case that they were looking for. Two weeks later, Keyes was arrested and left in Texas. When he was in police custody, he told them about his murder kits. The police found some of his kids in New York and Alaska. He's also admitted to killing several people. He said he would fly into different cities and then he would rent a car. 
He then drive long distances and kill people at random. He admitted to killing four people in Washington State, two people independently of each other, and then a couple. He never gave the names of his victims, even though the police suspected that he knew who his victims were. They were pretty sure that after he returned home to Anchorage after committing the murders, he had watched the media coverage of his murders. Besides Canning's murder, he only gave specific details on one set of murders. On June 2, 2011, Keyes flew to Chicago, Illinois. He rented a car, and then he drove 900 miles to Essex, Vermont. For three days, he roamed Essex, looking for victims. He settled on Bill Lorraine Courier, who he happened upon at random, and he chose them because they seemed like easy targets. He cut their phone line and then broke into their home. At gunpoint, he made them tie each other up with zip ties. He then took them to an abandoned house that he found a few days earlier. In the basement of the house, he shot Bill dead and then sexually assaulted Lorraine before shooting her to death as well. He hid their bodies among the debris inside the abandoned house. The house was later demolished and the ruins of the house, along with the bodies of Bill and Lorraine Courier, were taken away to a dump. Bill and Lorraine's bodies have never been found. On December 2nd, 2012, while he was in police custody, Israel Keyes took his own life. He slid his wrist and he strangled himself with his bed sheet. Before he died, Keyes admitted that he targeted random people, sometimes while they were camping. Since he traveled all over the country, even the FBI are unsure where he was at different times in the 2000s and the early 2010s. Besides admitting to the murders in Virginia, Alaska, and Washington, Keyes also either confessed or alluded to committing murders in Wyoming, Texas, and possibly Arizona. Arizona is where Lisa Guerrero and Brandon Rumba were killed in 2003. When they were killed, Keyes was living in Washington State. Also, he was living in Washington in 2006 when Mary Cooper and her daughter, Susanna Cooper Stodden, were killed in that state while they were on a hike. Unfortunately, since there was very little physical evidence found at the crime scenes, even if Keyes did commit the murders, it will be tough to connect him to any of the murders. On March 24, 2017, there was a shooting in Forestville, California, about 25 miles from Jenner, where Lindsay Cutshaw and Jason Allen were killed in 2004. The victim was Seamus Gallen, who was 36. His brother, Sean Gallen, was arrested for his murder. When Sean was in custody, the police told him they wanted to talk to him about the murders of Cutshaw and Allen. A few months after his arrest, he agreed and he led investigators to evidence that showed he committed the murders. In May 2018, he was arraigned for the murder of the couple. If he has confessed to being involved in any of the other murders, it has not been made public by the police. However, since the murders were committed hundreds of miles apart in different states, they may not be connected at all. The families of the victims are begging the killer, or killers, to come forward and take responsibility for what they did. Thank you so much for watching, hopefully you found that interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, please go to criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases, buy merch, and find out about an exclusive podcast. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.